So I called my insurance company and we've been going around for about a week and they kept telling me, oh no, you're fine. We don't need to update this. And I was like, no, I don't think you understand. I've been working out of my home and now I need insurance that supports if somebody comes onto my property and hurts themselves, I need insurance to support that. Mm. And finally, yesterday, someone was looking at it and they're like, we have you listed as a photographer. And I was like, I mean, I mm. do photography, but my main business is video creation. And that's what the studio is, is it's a video right. creation studio. Right. And they're like, oh, we don't support that kind of production. And I was like, excuse me. Welcome to The Practical Filmmaker, an educational podcast brought to you by the Filmmaker Institute and Sunscreen Film Festival, where industry professionals talk nuts and bolts and the steps they took to find their success today. On today's show, Boise-based filmmaker Steph Cullen talks about making the leap from corporate filmmaking into the world of freelancing, detailing her experience with legal contracts and insurance. Find the full transcripts and more at thepracticalfilmmaker.com. I'm your host, Tanya Musgrave, and today we're talking about going freelance after a full-time gig as a filmmaker. Steph Cullen is a Boise-based filmmaker who, after years of creating internal media at HP Corporate, moved to freelance filmmaking where she creates documentaries and short films for nonprofits and small startups, along with how-to training and industrial videos for larger corporations. Welcome to the show. Thank you. It's been a bit since we've been able to chat with a bit of a one-woman show where you take care of most, if not all, aspects of these projects. So walk me through how you got to where you are today. Ooh, okay. So how I got to where I am today, I worked at HP. What I did for them was for about seven years, I created internal video content. And that was anywhere from how to clear a paper jam, (laughs) how to turn on your PC, how to find the serial numbers, all the way to things such as bring your inventor to work day, which is like bring your kid to work day. So I would go around all day long, just grabbing footage of all these kids running in and out of the building and then turn it into a recap video. And so that's kind of where I started was with HP. And while I was there, I pursued a bachelor of science in digital cinematography through Full Sail University. Mm -hmm. I graduated valedictorian. Oh, Mm-hmm. Oh, <laughs> uh, that was 2017. Okay, nice. So 2017 is when I graduated. That's also the year that I registered my LLC mm-hmm. because I was already starting to create content for local nonprofits here in Boise. Mm-hmm. And a lot of that was volunteer work through HP. And so I decided, let's just register an LLC and where it, see where it takes us. That was mm-hmm. exactly five years ago. My anniversary was November 9th was now five years. Oh my gosh. So yeah. So as I continued creating local nonprofit videos and working at HP, I started to realize how much I enjoyed kind of creating my own stuff. In February of this year, 2022, I took the leap and I left my corporate job on very good terms, still Mm -hmm. wonderful with all the coworkers. There's some Mm -hmm. great relationships still. But I left and am now fully working for myself. Nice. So you went from, you really did take a leap because you went from a full-time job with benefits, retirement, insurance, and these are not small things for artists. Like it is not all the fun securities that we can get. First, let's talk about why. I mean, there is something I know that burns real uh, real deeply within artists. And it's just kind of one of those things where, okay, you have to do it, you have to create it, or else you're just gonna, your soul's gonna die. <laughs> but walk me through the why of your leap. I mean, that's a, that's a big sacrifice. It is. I'm also in grad school. So I'm going to throw that out there as oh my well. God. I- <laughs> Um, Not a lot at all. (laughs) No, no, just little things. But the why was, I don't know, we can blame it on the pandemic, which is Mm -hmm. what a lot of people say for their lives as well. But at that point in February of 2022, I realized this is the time that I need to jump out on my own and try to figure this out. And because I do still have a great relationship with people at HP, I also understood that (laughs) if I had to come back, I could. So yeah, I just felt like it was the right timing to take that leap. And I kind of, I do a lot of things on very specific days and times. And so I gave my notice on my seven-year anniversary in that job. And then within two weeks of that, I I was done. That was my last day, which was January 31st. 
Well, <laughs> that is, that is very, very specific. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> so with this pandemic, which was also not great for finances in general for a lot of people, <laughs> um, walk me through what that leap meant for you financially. I can talk about that and then also kind of hit back on why that leap at that time. During the pandemic, actually, the work that I was doing for all the nonprofits got really busy. And the reason why is nonprofits still need to raise money. They still need to reach their donors. They need to reach the people who are volunteering for them. And they still need to reach that community that they have their nonprofit for. So Mm -hmm. we've got people experiencing homelessness. We have people who are going through human rights issues, all all things like that. So my work with the nonprofits got really busy because all of their events went completely online, meaning nobody was in person. And so I created hours of video content for these various events. Financially, it was a huge shift because with HP, I was making upwards of about 74K a year, which is really great here in Boise. And it also came with benefits. I have a decent 401k. Mm -hmm. I had insurance, which was awesome because also in (laughs) the middle of the pandemic, I had an appendectomy. (gasps) Oh my gosh. (laughs) Yeah. So I had to go through that. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) And then also days off, like, you know, you get various holidays and I got I think I ended up leaving with about three weeks of vacation time Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. for a year. And as a lot of freelancers know, we don't get vacation time. It's every day, all day long. certainly not paid. (laughs) No. (laughs) You take a day off and you are, yeah, taking a day off of making. It's been tough because Mm -hmm. you watch that money that you were seeing come in every two weeks and it's no longer there. Mm -hmm. So I do still pay my bills as if I'm on a, every two week paycheck type of Mm -hmm. deal. Mm -hmm. But now it's more, okay, maybe we don't go out to eat right now. Or Mm -hmm. how about we turn the heat down a little bit in the winter time? (laughs) (laughs) Most definitely. I know that talking with just various filmmakers who they have a full-time job on the side, they have a part-time job on the side, they're driving for Uber Eats. You know, we talked about this a little bit with Nick Ritchie. He was one of our previous guests who yeah, instead of putting the down payment towards a home, he put it towards his film. <laughs> and, you know, I mean, it's just like whatever we do to make life work, to make our, our art work, you know, like that's that's what we do. And I think there's something to artists that were just crazy enough to do that just because the passion outweighs the need sometimes, you know. I used to see a personal trainer five days a week. Yeah. I've had to quit that. (laughs) (laughs) I know how that goes. Yeah. Like, I don't know. Gym membership? Nah. (laughs) Are you kidding Mm -hmm. me? Something that comes out of my paycheck like once a month? No. (laughs) Yeah. So you also went from corporations that I assume took care of the legal side of things going into a freelance position where all of a sudden you are taking care of all of that. What did you do about contracts once you were out on your own? I have some that we kind of formed while I was in my bachelor program. It was part of the program is to learn about all of these, but I'm actually still working on legalizing contracts and making sure that they work for both myself and my clients. So how are you figuring out how to legalize these things? Are you are you talking to a lawyer? Are you talking to like how did you find the person to talk to about this? I am getting the keys to my very first studio today. Ooh. And in prepping for that, I had to create a what's called a letter of intent, which is a letter to the business building owner saying, I want to rent this space. This is what I want it for. But it's a very legalese type of document. Mm -hmm. And I went through here in Idaho, the University of Idaho School of Law, and it was entrepreneurship law. And I worked with a student who held my hand the entire way through creating this letter of intent. Mm -hmm. And as they work For me, they also have their professor who was in on the meetings and in on every single email, making sure that this student was properly getting all the legalese finalized in this letter of intent. Goodness. Wait, so did you already know somebody or did you just like kind of knock on the door of the school and just be like, hey, I want to create a letter of intent. Who's going to help me? 
it was kind of that kind of knocking on the school door, but they do have this offering. Someone had mentioned it and then I went to their website and you can fill out a form saying this is what I want. And then they look through it and it takes them a couple of days to decide if they're able to take you on as a client. Oh, I think a lot of firms, they have a set number of hours that they have to do pro bono work. And I'm wondering if if for universities and stuff, that is a thing. I mean, it's worth checking out to, you you know, like your local university and, you know, seeing what's available to you for yeah. the people who cannot afford, you know, <laughs> $700 an hour for a lawyer. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So you've got all the legal stuff and then you also become your own IT person within mm-hmm. about two weeks of taking that leap. One of my hard drives failed. Of course. Yeah. Luckily, I didn't lose any film projects, but I did lose some other things on it. And it was one of those where it's like, I can't just call the IT department and ask them to come help me. Yeah. Now I have to figure this out. There is something about that leap. I don't know what it is about it. I mean, you know, I was just reminiscing or, you know, not reminiscing, I guess. I guess you could say fuming. (laughs) 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 with with another alumnus just about how man kids these days kids these days you know they they have so much more of a ladder than we did you know but there was something that we had to do which was we had to figure out how to pull ourselves up by our bootstraps you know those who had to kind of live through that type of quote-unquote trauma it they are extremely independent like extreme independence is born out of trauma in a way and it's just like well you needed to figure out how to do it and you figured it out. <laughs> Look at you now, you're here. I mean, like what when you have no other option but to figure it out, it's what you do. Exactly. What are some of the tools of your trade? Gears or gadgets that are like old reliables or resources? I love my cameras. I work on a Sony FS5, which was my kit camera from school. Mm -hmm. I carry that one all over the place. And especially because it's smaller, I just used it for a nonprofit event. What was it? Holiday Helper from the United Way of Treasure Valley. And I just walked around a very large cold room for a few hours for two nights. And having it that camera was very helpful because it's smaller. Mm -hmm. I also have a Sony FX9, Mm -hmm. which I adore and love working with, but it's much bigger. So that guy only comes out when I do like (laughs) sit down interviews. Yeah, 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 yeah. (laughs) One of my favorite, it's not a software, but it's a subscription that I have is with Artlist.io, which is my music subscription. And I I use that nearly every single day. Mm -hmm. And it's got all different types of music. And the reason why I really like this and I will continue paying the money for it is because every single video that I create, they want music. Mm -hmm. And like, for example, tonight is an event where they will show 18 videos that I created and each Mm -hmm. video has a different piece of music in it. And then an event that I did back in February, I think I... I think that one had almost 20 videos and each video had a different piece of music as well. And how about a favorite new gadget that revolutionizes how you work? That is a good question. New gadget that revolutionizes how I work. Well, if I could talk about software, it's FreshBooks, which is my accounting software. (laughs) Ooh, yeah. No, 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 absolutely. (laughs) I really like it. And it was suggested to me by a friend who saw it mentioned by another YouTuber, Mm. but FreshBooks, it can integrate with your bank account. So then Mm. I don't have to manually enter my expenses. I can create proposals and then turn those proposals into estimates and then turn those estimates into invoices all with various Mm. clicks of the button. And I can Mm. track my time. So if I want to charge hourly, then I I track time that way. So talking about the projects that you are doing specifically for nonprofits that don't necessarily, or maybe they do have a little bit of a budget for these videos. I mean, is it a project rate? Is it a day rate? How How do you make this work for you? Sometimes it's a project rate that I have for the nonprofits. And sometimes it's hourly. All my nonprofits do get discounts from my regular rates. Mm -hmm. And when we go the project route, I've actually, what I do is I keep track of my time, whether it's just a project charge or hourly charge. And the prices that I've come up for all of my projects tend to work out hourly. So if I spend Uh 
three hours in post-production on a video, I already, that project I charged like a three hour rate basically. Okay. Okay. Yeah. And that's how I've been doing it. And it's pretty amazing that I've been quite spot on with how much I charge (laughs) hourly versus project wise. It's pretty interesting. What would you say is the percentage of the, the projects that you do? Like how many corporate videos for larger corporations that kind of helped fund maybe like, or subsidize more of your time in these nonprofit sectors that you want to do that are maybe more passion projects? The percentage of corporate work to nonprofit work. Oh, I hadn't thought about it that way, but I think maybe 30% is corporate and the rest are nonprofit. So you are actually able to put your passion into the things that you love. You know, a lot of the times it's like, okay, well, it's like 90% corporate, 10% what we actually want to (laughs) do. Yeah. Yeah. And you make it work for you. And that's awesome. So I want to talk about the things that don't necessarily work. Do you have any stories of when something went wrong? Yes. Actually, just yesterday, in getting this new studio space, I also needed to contact my business insurance company and let them know that I'm moving into a space that I'm also going to be renting out to other production companies if they need it because it's got a psych wall, it's got a podcasting room, it's got a meeting room, all Mm -hmm. the things that a production might want. So I called my insurance company and we've been going around for about a week and they kept telling me, oh no, you're fine. We don't need to update this. And I was like, no, I don't think you understand. I've been working out of my home and now I need insurance that supports if somebody comes onto my property and hurts themselves, I need insurance to support that. Mm. And finally, yesterday, someone was looking at it and they're like, we have you listed as a photographer. And I was like, I mean, I Mm. do photography, but my main business is video creation. And that's what the studio is, is it's a video right. creation studio. Right. And they're like, oh, we don't support that kind of production. And I was like, excuse me. So for over a year now that I've had this business insurance, uh, I've actually been paying for something I don't do. Uh, and they're like, yeah, and we can cancel this in March. And I was like, so am I even covered right now? And he was oh like, well, let me give you a phone number so you can get some good insurance. Oh my gosh. Maybe it's good for awareness. Like, by the way, this particular policy doesn't cover what you do. Yeah. And it was a matter of one, the person that I originally spoke to not understanding exactly what I do. Okay. And then two, probably at the time, video production was not as big as it is today. I'm trying to remember back to the original conversation and they had a hard time really pinpointing what I do. And Mm. so I think they settled on photography and convinced me that this is going to cover me because the insurance Mm. that I originally needed was for myself and my equipment when I go to locations. So I go to a nonprofit facility or I go to an event facility that's hosting the nonprofit for an Mm -hmm. evening. I used to have nationwide and it was like underneath a renter's insurance policy that you could have an inland marine policy. Mm -hmm. And an inland marine was something that you could like, you know, put a bunch of your stuff like your equipment and, you know, all of that stuff in there. And that would be covered past, you know, what your renter's insurance would be. And that's kind of what I used to to cover everything. But that's when I actually was doing photography. Now that you're saying that they didn't really know how to categorize you, I mean, and this is back in like 2011, but I do remember them saying along those lines, which is like, okay, well, you're either a photographer or you work in TV, you work in television and film. And I'm just like, no, (laughs) but that's not what I do. And there didn't seem to be a filmmaker category. So what number did they give you? Did they give it like a completely different company? Is it under a different like name of a policy? They said I had a broker and I was like, I don't think I have a broker, but okay. So they sent me back to a broker and it was so weird because I had to call and leave a voicemail. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) Which, you know, we don't really do these days. So I called and left a voicemail and then I started doing some research and I found a broker, I guess, which is a this umbrella company. You tell them what you want. And then last night she told me that they will reach out to up to eight insurance companies. And I will start getting calls today to try to get their correct insurance. And I need the coverage almost immediately because I get yeah. keys today. 
Right, right. Seriously. So with your space, are you covering renter's insurance with that space? So is your policy going to be under renter's insurance? I think so. And I don't understand insurance well enough to know all the ins and outs of it. My gosh. But yeah, (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) that's the thing, though, is you're trusting these people to understand what your requests are. Yeah. Yeah. And then all of a sudden you find out I wasn't properly covered for over a year. (laughs) (laughs) What have I been paying into? A pit. (laughs) That's it. (laughs) My gosh. Yeah. So, well, I hope you figured that part out. My gosh. Uh, Well, that is definitely something that went wrong. Yay. In any case, so one of the things that is on your site is, so is it OMG, Female Filmmakers? Yes. Tell me about that. So I came up with the name OMG, Female Filmmakers, back while I was doing my undergrad. And it was one of those where you show up on set and you're kind of one of the only females there. (laughs) And we all make mistakes. But it felt like I was made fun of a little more for the mistakes that I was making. (laughs) And so I just would start throwing out the phrase, oh, my God, female filmmakers. How (laughs) did I not know this? And it kind of (laughs) stuck. They exist? What? Yeah. Oh, my God. They're real? (laughs) So that's what I decided to call my company. But during all of that, I was working at HP. And it was odd for people there as well to see this female in a position of like tech stuff, you know, Mm -hmm. granted HP is a very progressive company, but there's still, there's a girl behind a camera. That's Mm -hmm. weird. (laughs) (laughs) It's like, yes, I'm here. (laughs) Yeah. 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 I mean, I think it's changing, you know, I think there's, there's definitely a, a shift on the horizon that I've noticed. I put together some events and I, you know, would put together a roster of people to talk to, you know, oh, hey, you know, let's put together this documentary panel. And actually it was an old professor of mine, you know, white male, you know, he was, he was the one who pointed out to me, were you aware that or, you know, did you notice that there were actually no females on this panel and there are also not really any people of color? And I was just like, oh, my stars, like you are 100 percent right. <laughs> like, You know, in my mind, I mean, and some people they'll fight for this. Like, I just want to be a filmmaker, you know, like I don't you know, I don't want to be a female filmmaker. I don't want to be an Asian filmmaker. I just want to be a filmmaker. But at the same time, it is nice to know that there are advocates who are thinking about that, that they're actually giving you a chance. But then also that, you know, yeah, they'll call you out too and just be like, oh, by the way, were you wanting any females in this? (laughs) 100%. Yes, I was. Thank you. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. I think it is changing. You know, there are a lot of people out there that they'll speak up about it. So that's good. Yeah, Um, that is really good. mm -hmm. So with your nonprofit work or, you know, what would you say is your favorite to work with? One of my favorite nonprofits to work with is called the Wasmuth Center for Human Rights. Mm -hmm. And it might be because they were my first, but they do so much work in our community for human rights. And we've done anywhere from video content for their events where it's talking about this program and that program to they took me to Cambodia one year to shoot a documentary out there. And this year for their event, their big celebration was all about the the art of human rights. Mm -hmm. I got to interview so many artists in our town and meet all these incredible people. And it's artists from a mosaic artist to a metal artist, to wood carving, to painting, to this other type of painting. And that was the best because I just got to meet some incredible people in our, our town of Boise. When you're talking about doing these projects, I know that you say short films as well. So would you say that you gravitate more towards documentary than narrative? Now, yes, because that's the need and the want. But when I have time for myself, which is not very often, (laughs) I do love creating narratives. I love comedies only because I want to make people laugh because life Mm -hmm. is so, there's a lot going on in life. Mm -hmm. And to provide a little bit of humor and a little bit of laughter is something that I love doing for people. Mm -hmm. And one of my most recent narratives, I didn't write this one, my friend Allie did, but it just won Best Comedy last year at 
the Misfit Film Festival in Arizona. Oh, nice. Very yeah. nice. <laughs> That's awesome. So you've been at this for since February, right? So a good solid nine months of it now. I want you to give me a highlight and a low light <laughs> of your experience so far. Having leapt into the abyss, what is a highlight and a low light? Mm. Highlight is I am my own boss. Mm. I only answer to myself. Mm. Low light is I am my own boss. I only <laughs> answer to myself because I'm still going through the process of letting go of that corporate lifestyle because I didn't take a break. So I left, my last day at HP was January 31st. And within a day already, I was doing work outside mm. of like for nonprofits or anything So you had else. already lined stuff up. Oh yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. There was no break. Yep. Yeah. I had that stuff lined up. And so I'm still working through the process of kind of not getting rid of that corporate life, but realizing that it doesn't have to be so regimented. Mm -hmm. Like my hours, you know, I get anxiety if I'm not sitting at my computer checking my email at 8 a.m. Oh, no, I'm my boss. Who no. cares if I'm not sitting there checking email at 8 a.m.? So that's the low part is also reminding myself, you are your own boss. You you can make your own decisions. I can imagine that is quite a transition Maybe this is like part of a pandemic thing too, but I remember having a little bit of, wait, I can drive down to Utah. Wait, is there any reason why I can't wait? No, I don't have to like, I don't, uh, yeah, that's right. Like I don't have to submit anything. I don't have to get anything approved. Like, <laughs> like I'm not using up PTO. I'm not like, <laughs> like all of this stuff I did a whole, like many years more of freelancing than I did of corporate. I only did three and a half years of corporate. And so, you know, it was a pretty fast transition for me. But at the same time, I remember it was like a night of anxiety where I was spending over half an hour trying to figure out what, form of toothpaste that I should take? Should I like, I, oh, should I take travel? It was so dumb. It was the dumbest debate that I had in my head when I could have thrown the whole tube in my car. Cause it was the car. I was like, I was, I was driving. <laughs> it was so dumb. Right. But it was like the travel anxiety. I think part of it was from the pandemic too, but like, <laughs> you know, realizing that you don't have anybody to answer to and well, and then also, oh no, I don't have anybody to answer to. Like nobody, like if I don't eat, it is my own problem. <laughs> yep. Yeah, exactly. If I choose to stay up until 1am editing video and then feel like I need to be up at 5 a.m. the next morning to start working on emails, that's on me. That is mm -hmm. my problem, not yes. anybody else's. <laughs> yeah. If the old you could see you now, what would the old you say? I was actually having a text conversation with a friend from junior high school about this last night. Really? Yeah. So I have a very good cinematographer friend here in Boise, and it turns out that we both went to the same junior high and high school, <laughs> okay. but this was back in Washington State. Okay. Not even here in Boise. Neither Dang. of us are from here. You know, I've always wanted to make movies, even when I was doing theater. So I started on the theater stage in junior mm -hmm. high school and then moved into that in high school. But when they would ask you, what do you want to be when you grow up? All the friends would be like, I want to go to Broadway. I'm going to go to New York and be on the stage. And I would say, I want to make movies. So yeah, I think my younger self would be very proud of where I am today. And also a little shocked, like, wow, you're actually doing this? <laughs> what happened to marrying the doctor your parents wanted you to marry? <laughs> uh, oh, that comes with its own baggage, I'm guessing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Oh my gosh. The question that I love wrapping up every interview with is what question should I have asked you? What's my favorite movie? Ooh, what is your favorite movie? Goonies. <laughs> <laughs> yes. You cannot beat nostalgia. No, Why is you it can't. your favorite? Why is it your favorite? It came out in the 80s when I was a kid. And that is the one movie that my, I'm the oldest of four kids. So all my siblings and then all my cousins out in Hawaii, which is where I'm from, 
we all talk about the Goonies and <laughs> they all have kids. I don't have kids of my own, but they all have kids and all their kids have to watch the Goonies. <laughs> and it's just one of those movies that we all of us identify with. That's me with Sandlot. Like, I always make people watch Sandlot <laughs> every 4th of July. I don't know why. There's a, it's, a, it's a thing with 4th of July. You just got to watch the kids playing baseball by the, like, under the light of fireworks. Like, come on. <laughs> with America the Beautiful playing in the background. I don't know. But, man, yes. yeah, Sandlot is, yeah, that's nostalgia. You can't beat it. <laughs> well, we really love chatting with you. How do people find you or follow your work? This is your shameless plug up. Okay, so you can find me at my website, which is omgfemalefilmmakers.com. And then if you are interested in booking a tour at my studio, which we will have a soft opening in December, that would be omgfemalefilmmakers.com slash omg, I think there's a hyphen in there, studios. Thank you very much for sharing your experience, your story, and your time. Thank you for having me. This has been great. I love talking about this stuff. If you enjoyed this interview, follow us right here and on Instagram, ask us questions and check out more episodes at thepracticalfilmmaker.com. Be well and God bless. We'll see you next time on The Practical Filmmaker.